This is Dan Schneider, and on this edition of the Dan Schneider Video Interview, I will be doing something a little bit different. Unlike other shows where I talk about a certain subject, on art or philosophy or religion, uh, this will be a more personal journey, and this will be more or less an archival type interview rather than an interview that's probing a subject. The subject of this interview will be writer, actor, diplomat, George Dickerson, who led an interesting life and was a friend of mine for over a decade. And I will be talking with a man named Richard Hobby, who was involved in business with George. And we will be talking memories about George Dickerson in what I am calling the George Dickerson Project. And this is the very first interview. So please stay with us. Well, uh, in this interview, as I had mentioned, uh, uh, we'll be talking about the life uh, of George Dickerson, and this is the first of hopefully a handful at minimum of interviews. And George Dickerson, for those people who are familiar with my website, Cosmoetica, may have seen some of his old short stories reprinted, uh, read some of his poems. Uh, I did an, uh, an interview with him uh, on an internet radio show called Omniverska, which you can find online uh, on my Cosmoetica YouTube page. And also, I did a written interview with him, the, a Dan Schneider uh, interview in the written format that uh, was about seven, eight years ago. Richard Harvey, the man you see before you, uh, also knew George Dickinson. I never met George Dickinson in person. I had about a dozen-year uh, relationship with him via phone and email. Uh, uh, but Richard uh, was in business with him. Richard is helping to produce a screenplay that George did about a segment of his life his life about 40 years ago when he was a diplomat uh, in the Lebanon area back in the 1970s. So Richard, uh, thank you. Welcome uh, to the sh show. Um, let's just talk, let's talk, you're welcome. Let's just talk a little bit about yourself and, and how you, you uh, run uh, a company called Zero Circle Films, and that's also the website, zerocirclefilms.com. And you're looking to help produce uh, George's screenplay. So why don't we uh, talk a little bit about how you met George, uh, his screenplay, and then we'll work back into more personal anecdotes. So uh, let's talk about uh, how you first met George Dickerson. Sure. Well, uh, it goes back, I would say, about 10 years or so. Uh -huh. um, and I have a good friend. I, I live in Maine, and a good friend of mine is a guy named Bill Searle. George Dickerson and Bill Searle were at Yale together as classmates. And they became very, very close friends. Very different kinds of people, but they, they, they were, have remained friends all their lives. Unfortunately, as you know, George has just died a few months ago. A very sad affair, particularly for Bill, because they go way back. But um, a number of years ago, Bill Searle and his wife, Chiquetta, invited me and my wife and my kids to have dinner at their place in Freeport, and uh, said that George Dickerson and his wife, uh, Suzanne, would be there, and please join them. So I did, and ahead of time, I did a little research on George because uh, Bill had told me about him, and I knew that George was a poet, so I looked up his, poet, uh, his poetry online, and I read him quite a bit of it. And my favorite one is a famous one, I'm, I'm sure you've read it too, uh, Dan, A Mist of White Horses. Yeah. You're familiar, you're familiar with that poem, I assume. Yes. And um, so I read that one, and that one was particularly beautiful, elegantly done in a certain form, a French form, I forget the name of it, but uh, it moved me deeply. So anyway, I went to the dinner, our, my family, and Bill and Jaquetta and George and Suzanne, and we had a wonderful time together, and I got talking to George. Of course, he has a strong background in film himself, having acted out in Hollywood and uh, David Lynch's Blue Velvet, as well as in Hill Street Blues and other things. And so, and I have a passion for cinema, obviously, and we got talking and we had a great time. And I told him about my beliefs and my work as a film critic, both on the West Coast and the East Coast. So that was great. And then we said, let's keep in touch. So we did a little bit. And then a number of months go by and George called me up and said, I'm putting together, or I have put together, uh, and I'm continuing to build on a team to produce a film um, from a, a, from, on, based on my screenplay uh, called The Fool's Errand, which was um, an expansion of a short story he had written and which was published in uh, Penthouse Magazine, I think in 84, 
five, although I might have the date wrong, but something like that, called A Man Who Loved Butterflies. Yeah. And George had been in Lebanon. You were absolutely right. He was in Lebanon as part of the United Nations. He was working with, uh, to help the refugee situation over there. And then he got caught in the crossfire of all the different factions and uh, had a number of horrendous things go on. But he was drawn into it because he was over there to do good. Um, I believe he sent his family back, his wife back, but, and his son, but he stayed. And it drew him in, and he was at one point, a uh, gun was put to his head. Uh, that's a story in itself. <laughs> and then he was kidnapped, uh, and then he did escape, or did get out. But based on that experience, he, um, and at the urging of Dayan Georgievich, who was a cinematographer and director, also in New York, um, he, he encouraged George to write this screenplay, and so George did, and Dan's been very involved with it throughout the process, and knows it intimately. So, at any rate, that's the, the background on that, and so George called me up, explained that all to me, and said um, he was putting the team together, and that the executive producer that he'd had in mind wasn't going to work out, and then he, he said, um, so, sort of, calf, calf, I was wondering whether you might be interested in that. And uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, to show you uh, what a neophyte I was, I said, I'd love to, but what is it, what is it executive producer? <laughs> and because uh, my, my business was more on the film criticism side and writing about films. Uh -huh. And uh, I only had a foggy idea about how they were actually made at that time. And so, um, and one of the great things about working with George was I got a, a really a great crash, crash course and then a longstanding many years education in the business. Um, but I said, I'd love to. What is an executive producer? So he explained it to me. And uh, he said, there's, there's two kinds, but the one he was looking for, because uh, there's one, the executive producer, that kind of is really overseeing the entire project. But more often, it really means the guy that raises the money. And he said it would be about $20 million. And I thought, well, I've been in the search business and in the sales business, and I love film, and I love George's script. Oh, I actually, I forgot one important thing. I should back up. Um, it was a little bit before this, George asked me to read his screenplay before he got into the executive producer part of it. I forgot to mention this. And he, he said, read it. He said, most people don't know how to read a screenplay. I said, I think I do, uh, given my background. But uh, let me read it anyway. I'd be happy to. And as a critic, and I'm a very, very tough critic, Dan. So um, most screenplays and most films... I consider mediocre and often pathological. I read it, I took three pages of handwritten notes and they were all positive. It's an extraordinary screenplay, brilliant and deeply moving. And so I called him up uh, unexpectedly saying, George, I can't quite believe this, but uh, usually I have blistering things to say about these things. I try to say it diplomatically when people ask me to read their screenplays, but nonetheless, I usually find them lacking. Yours on the other hand is a, is a masterpiece and um, I, I encourage you to get it produced. So that was the, the part I, I forgot to mention. So then he called me a few months later and then threw out this idea of my being the executive producer. So I said, sure. I, I, I don't sell, like to sell things unless I'm passionate about them, but I am passionate about this. I said, I want to. I have a background in search, but I don't have a background in, in the film world of producing. He said, that's okay. Um, this is going to be done outside the Hollywood system as much as we can. And you're being an outsider, but with your passion and your background in search and sales, I think you could do the job. I said, well, it's true. I know a lot of people around the world, and I would I love to do this. I love cold calling. I love calling people I know and kicking ideas around. So that's how it started. Um, unless I got into this, this thing with George, um, and I am working on raising the money still. And I've had a number of close calls and getting it done. So far, not successful, but I'm confident that we will do it in the end. Yeah, I did read uh, the, the screenplay, too, back in uh, September of '09. George had sent it to me. And I remember, too, that it was, uh, it was very tight. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't like a poetic screenplay the way like an Ingmar Bergman's would have been, but it was, it was, a, very, it was a very detailed screenplay. I remember, too, that uh, the, the, not, not the stage directions, but the directions that you would give for a director were specific enough that you could could visualize something, but also allow for a little bit of leeway for a director a director to have handed. So I remember it was a very tight screenplay. That was that was one of my uh, uh, 
my observations when I first read it. And, uh, you know, I read it in, in two days and, it, you know, it was very good. I had nothing but positive things to say about it as well. Let's, uh, so that's how you met Joy. Um, let's talk then about uh, uh, the trying to get it produced. Was that how you formed Zero Circle Films or was that already an extant uh, thing that uh, you had going? Actually, a, a good question. Uh, Zero Circle Films uh, started uh, several years later and came about partly by my work with George. So it was an offshoot of that. Because uh -huh. my background, um, even though Zero Circle Films in its current form uh, is strictly me, I started this with a, for a close friend of mine out on the West Coast about three years ago, thinking we were going to actually produce movies and make them ourselves, maybe two or three a year. And after uh, forming a company and getting an LLC going and uh, having serious talks and spending money on lawyers and, and, uh, and getting the ball rolling and talking to a number of people, uh, even though my friend out on the West Coast was a very experienced CEO and a startup guy, he also had never produced a movie. And even though I have a background in things very related, including lots of film work you know, from a film criticism point of view, neither of us had actually made a movie. And we felt that we could bring in people, but it was... Uh, we, we dropped that, and then a five, five days later, as I was talking to a friend of mine named Harper, I said, Harper, looks like that project is not, Zero Circle Films and that as a production company is not going forward, um, and now I'm trying to figure out what to do, and he said, I've got the perfect solution for you that's even better. You, you can run it yourself, it's very inexpensive to start it up, and thus Zero Circle Films in its current form was started, and that was about two and a half years ago. Uh, basically, Zero Circle Films is in, a, in its essence is the, the idea behind it is to introduce people to great films that they wouldn't normally know about. Not because they're old; some of them could have been made last year, but for a number of reasons, they have uh, gotten lost. Or I, I bring them into the fore in the foreground and put a spotlight on them. Could be American, could be European art films. Could be old films, could be films that were just made last year, like The Counselor, for example, by Ridley Scott, which nobody seemed to like and did terribly at the box office, and I consider it to be a masterpiece. The conceptually, Dan, to get a little bit more into the philosophy behind Zero Circle Films, which relates back to George, as I'll explain, there's something called what I call the third way. I've developed this concept over the last few years. I'm going to oversimplify this, and we can get into more detail if it interests you, but a lot of films are what I call first way. That is to say they're basic, decent, mainstream entertainment out of bourgeois films. And I don't sneer at that word bourgeois. I consider that to be reasonable. The bourgeoisie and mainstream decent rules, hey, that's what makes society go. Then a group of hot shots came into the, into the fore and over the last 50 years saying, oh, this mainstream decent stuff, it's so boring and it's oppressive. We want to be free. We're smarter than that. We have great talent. But they put their artistic talent to what I would call adolescent rebellious destruction. And those are films of what I call the second way, um, pathological rebellion against the mainstream. And that is basically what we are presented with as our choices. You can go through life, not just in film, but in every way, as a mainstream decent person of the bourgeoisie, or you could decide to be a rebel. And nine out of 10 times when you're a rebel, you're actually being destructive and childish. But what people don't realize is, and I said this all came together, is that films occasionally, less than 1%, are of what I call the third way. Flaubert said, Gustave Flaubert, the French writer said, live like a bourgeois during the day so that you can write like a madman at night. I adjust that slightly to mean don't waste your life tearing down like Louis Boudwell does, you know, all of the, the old order. Do something truly poetic and beautiful. Enzo Siciliano, who worked with Alberto Moravia and um, Bernardo Bertolucci, said that the purpose of art is to express and bring forth a poetic feeling of existence. And what is poem? It's about light and goodness, innocence, beauty, and love. Those are words, which I don't mean a cheap pop uh, way, but in, in the essence at the deepest level. 
And that's what George Dickerson's screenplay is all about. It's what I call a third way film because you've got all this stuff going on, the violence, his attempt to do good, and then as the story unfolds and he meets the Dane in the hut where he's kidnapped with him, and the Dane changes the Eric Erickson's life, the character, which is really very much like George, and it becomes one of the most beautiful. But when I just reread The Man Who Loved Butterflies a few weeks ago, thinking, well, I know this story well, and by the time I was finished, I was in not only by the time I was finished, several times I was in tears reading it, tears of joy and tears of sorrow. So George Dickerson, maybe it's a long preamble to just say George Dickerson has written a third way film, which is the highest praise that I as a film critic can give to any, any screenplay or any movie. Yeah, uh, The Man Who Loved Butterflies is on Cosmoetica. It's, uh, if you go to my website and just Google that or just Google George Dickerson, uh, you can find uh, it on Cosmoetica. I, I've had it online for about the last decade or so. So, um, so let, let's get back. Uh, you any uh, big publication? You said you were out on, on the West Coast. What, what, what is your background then uh, in film criticism? I, I was a film critic for Art Week in San Francisco um, and then moved east and wrote... Um, for uh, not as a regular uh, writer, but I, I, I did uh, one piece for the Sunday Boston Globe, and then I came up to Maine and was film critic um, for Maine Public Radio. Uh -huh. uh, and, so now, and now I have my own website with my own writings on. on um, so it sounds like Zero Circle Films. I had interviewed a, a man named... Uh, uh, John Farr, we, I did a show on Humphrey Bogart uh, a month or so ago, and he's got a, a website called Movies by Farr where he's, he's basically trying to provide what he, he uh, considers quality movies uh, for people who subscribe to his website. Is that something similar that you're doing? You know, uh, John Farr, I've heard of him, and I believe several years ago a friend of mine mentioned him, and I, I looked up his website at the time, and, and uh, it seemed like a, a, a very good place, but I... Also, I, mean, I have a feeling that he's doing something just a little bit different from me, but I really can't say much about what he's doing because I haven't really looked at it recently. But um, I suppose, Dan, that uh, each person who's writing film criticism, criticism comes into it with their own vision of what makes for a great film. Um, and I, obviously, from what I've just said a little while ago, uh, I certainly do. So uh, let's talk then about the process of the last few years. So I know in '09, uh, George had uh, had, I guess that was sort of the beginning. He had finished it, I believe, in '08. Uh, who who I know he had said there were some uh, European investors that initially he thought he might get it done in by t ten or eleven, uh, but then that fell through. Um, what what kind of a you know, what is the process of, of trying to get a film made that you've been trying as, as an independent producer? Um, you said you do a lot of cold calling. Do you call up uh, people that you've just worked with solely? Do you call up people who are known financiers in the film industry? How does that work? Do you, you know, if, the, if he was alive, I think he's dead, Dino De Laurentiis, would you call up a Dino De Laurentiis office and say, Dino, I've got this great war story? Uh, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, I'll introduce it maybe by telling you a sort of fun story, an amusing story, and and uh, that's when, um, are you familiar with the film Body Heat? Yes. Um, that's a great example of a third way film that looks just like another sexy thriller, but I consider it to be one of the 10 greatest films of all time. Um, and I have seen it many, many times. And so one day, I, I, and I continue to say, I don't understand how I mean, Lawrence Kasdan is a good director, but this film stands out from his other work, in my opinion, mm -hmm. as being a masterpiece. And how is that possible? And my daughter said, well, sometimes the uh, producer has a significant role, kind of like an eminence glise behind the scenes. And I said, that's an interesting idea, so I think I'll uh, call him. So I looked up on the internet, uh, on IMDb, and found that uh, Fred T. Gallo was the, was the producer on that film. And I looked up his credentials and saw, indeed, he had produced some Woody Allen movies that were really good and a number of other films that I thought were above average. So I thought, my, my daughter may be right. 
So I called up, I looked up the number for Paramount, the 800 number, called this number, and found, I, I knew that uh, Fred T. Gallo was, at that time, the top dog internationally for worldwide, worldwide production for Paramount. And I thought, well, I'll call. I probably won't get through. But as I told you, Dan, I love cold calling. And I mean, what have you got to lose? You, if you get through, you're a hero. And if you don't get through, well, you're no worse off than you were. So I called up. And the receptionist said, uh, Paramount Pictures. And I said, Fred T. Gallo, please. She said, one moment. And uh, the next thing I know, a man's voice answers. And it wasn't Fred T. Gallo. It was his secretary. I explained why I was calling. It was about the making of body heat. And he said, well, Mr. Gallo is tied up at the moment, but I'll take a message for you. And I said, fine. I gave my name and number. I expected that to be, I mean, who am I? Nobody in the industry, right? I'm not Roger Ebert or anything close to that. So much to my delight and surprise, unfortunately, it happened to be free. The phone rings at 9 o'clock the next morning, and it's Fred Gallo. And he gave me 20 minutes of his time, uh, answered all my questions, and um, it said, no, he wasn't the secret genius behind the film. He was very modest and uh, just said he did his role. But uh, so that's a little vignette to say, to answer your question, um, how do I go about this? It's I call anybody and everybody, famous or not famous, people in Europe, people in Asia, people in the Middle East, and people, of course, in America, people I know through business, people I know friends. I have made hundreds and hundreds of calls. And the idea is you just do this as an outsider. If I were an insider in Hollywood, I'd pick up and maybe make one call, call somebody's agent, or call some guy I worked with who had, had to spare $20 million, and we cut the deal very easily. But I'm an outsider, and, and George really didn't want me to go to Hollywood. So in fact, it was to stay away from, from that and see if, because we didn't want to lose control. And um, so when I went through my Rolodex, if you will, my files, I have files and files and files, because one of my businesses is called Reengage, and it's a search business. And I worked with national magazines and national corporations uh, like Pepsi or MetLife or Better Homes and Gardens and so on to find interview subjects, and I interview them. But I have to track them down. So I have this bloodhound instinct, this detective work, which I love. And so uh, one of the people in my files was a guy who was a Middle East expert. And I called him, and it turned out the timing was right. And he, he had a whole lot of ideas of people in the Middle East that he knew who might spring for the money. So I have talked to people in Syria, in Egypt, all over the Middle East. And some of them looked really promising, but in the end, none of those worked out. So I hope that answers your question, that I just keep calling. And because the thing of it is, I might have uh, hundreds of people I call, but things work, and then they know 100 people. So yeah. they go to work for you. Or they give you one lead, and that leads to something else. So it's detective work, and it's sales work, and it's bloodhound work. And you just keep going until you crack the code, break through. Yeah, I know a uh, George... Uh... I've often said he had a very uh, Leonard Zelig-like life. Uh, the Woody Allen film Zelig, where uh, it was sort of pre uh, Forrest Gump, and that uh, uh, the, the Zelig character knew a lot of people, and you know he was inserted into sort of uh, uh, a lot of historical situations. And George knew a lot of people in uh, film and uh, in politics and uh, writing and whatnot. And I always uh, I always try to t tell him to you know use his connections to, to get people to, to ask, but I know he was always very reluctant to do so. How, how involved uh, with the process with you was George when he was alive? Uh, was he, uh, was he uh, giving you names or what? Or did he just basically let you do what you needed to do? Uh, we were in touch constantly. Um, and also Dan Georgievich, they were work, they formed a company called Jonglers Junction. That was the production company in New York city. And so I uh, wound up talking to, to Dayon a lot as well. But George, uh, the idea was that if I, through my contacts, find somebody, then I, as the executive producer, and I bring in the money, my reward, like a sales guy, is to get a certain percentage. Um, but if they have their own contacts, people that George or Dayon knew within the industry, because Dayon is a spectacular cinematographer, um, very much with many awards to his name, and those people in Hollywood and all over the place. So they were working in parallel with me with their contacts, which was fine. But since they knew them and I didn't, only occasionally would I be brought in to talk something over. Now, sometimes that might happen. but um, So we were working very harmoniously together, always communicating, but I was running my own, 
my own list, and they were making whatever calls they could. But they were spending more of their time. George was not doing much of that. He was doing mostly working and refining the screenplay. And Dayan, of course, was working full time on all of his work as a cinematographer in New York. And, and so um, most of the work for finding the funding was, was on me, but through, through my contacts. But as I say, working closely with George. Uh, other than uh, George's screenplay, uh, are you currently involved in any other uh, projects? Um, to like produce a, a, another film? Yeah. No, my work is at this point, I decided once I decided with my friend on the West Coast not to get into production of films, um, to stay out of that unless something crossed my desk. I, w I wouldn't decline it. In other words, if something crossed my desk that I was equally in love with and I felt that I could produce it or help in producing it, then I would be happy to do so. But um, my film work is now focused on zero circle films. I, where do you, th do you think, if you were to give a percentage uh, of the, the film getting made, say in the next five or 10 years, say by 2020 or 2025, do you think that uh, it's going to get made or do you think it's going to be one of those things that, that is just going to be a project that isn't. The reason I ask is because I know George Dickerson uh, has a son, Dome Karakowski, who's apparently a well-regarded filmmaker in Finland. And I was wondering uh, if uh, he has ever expressed any interest in getting involved in his father's project, because I know George was reluctant to get his son involved as well. You know, I'm not quite sure what uh, how George left it with Dome. I was, I have been in touch with Dome slightly. I think we've had a few emails, I, and George introduced me to him. And I know Dayan is still in touch with him, as is Suzanne and Aaron. Of course, Suzanne, uh, George's wife, and Aaron, his daughter. Um, but uh, as far as your, your question about do I, what do I think the odds of it getting produced in the next five to ten years, I actually am optimistic, maybe cautiously optimistic, but optimistic, and I'm optimistic for several reasons. First of all, it's truly a great script, and it's not just I who, who, who believes in the project. So it's not like just another throwaway film that, eh, if it doesn't get made, does it really matter to the, to the, <laughs> to the world? So uh, Dan's passionate about it, I'm passionate about it, Aaron and Suzanne, of course, want to get it made, and other people that know about it. Um, so that's one reason. There's a lot of devotion to it. Um, secondly, neither Dayan nor I nor Suzanne or other people or Aaron are, have given up on it. Even though I'm working on a whole lot of other things, I always have uh, always have a fool's errand uh, in my hip pocket, ready to pull out at any party I'm at, anybody I meet on a train, wherever I go. If it's appropriate, obviously I'm not going to shove it down people's throats, but I often slip it into the conversation to see if there's a way to, to make something happen. And sometimes. Things do happen. People take an interest. So far, not enough. So I also think that as the cost of production with new technology, these new cameras and other things, I'm hoping that over time the budget can be reduced significantly. Yeah. And the, the reason it's been a struggle, one of the reasons it's been a struggle, but a significant reason is that we started this right when the economy fell apart, as you may recall, back 2000. Eight, nine, ten, right in there, and it was just a disaster. So a lot of people that might have gone in pulled back, and twenty million dollars then for an independent film was a bit of a stretch. Um, and so when the economy in trouble, it was became very difficult. But I'm hoping that as the uh, assuming the economy continues to expand and continue, and hope hopefully the the budget will be able to be reduced. The combination will plus the passion of all of us behind it. Uh, there's a good chance it will get made. Uh, by whom? I'm not sure. Uh, my, my friend on the West Coast that I mentioned, he actually wound up uh, that where we started this company uh, three years ago and then disbanded it to produce films. He's now actually back in film production through the back door. And that's another long story, which I won't go into, but he, he spoke to me recently and said, at the right moment, later this year, I want to introduce The Fool's Aaron to my team. Uh, and these are more Hollywood insiders working with people, or one guy in, in Hollywood. Uh, so that will obviously require negotiations, and we'll see whether it actually takes off. But it's just one example to answer your question of, do I think it'll get made? Yes, I do. So, Yeah, I know I often get uh, requests from people uh, at small, like I live in the Austin, Texas area, so we have the South by Southwest Film Festival, and 
I've gotten over the years lots of uh, people wanting me to review small films. Most of them are slasher type films, and I'm like, I'm not interested. But every so often, I get interesting projects. Uh, recently, I reviewed a, a film by a a guy from uh, Latvia called Sebastian Westman. It's a it was a film called Metaphora, and the visuals on that are just really stunning. And it's a it's a low budget film, and uh, it's it doesn't have any characters. It's it's a series of uh, of interesting uh, uh, pieces, and then uh, back in February, I had in, 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 Michael Jason Allen, who shot a film for five thousand uh, dollars called uh, "The Coldest Kiss." It's sort of like a, a neo noir set in the nineteen forties, and it's got some issues with the screenplay and the acting, but the cinematography is just breathtaking. And he did this for five thousand dollars with uh, I, I don't know the type of camera. So as far as the cost coming down, I would think that. Uh, you know that that should probably be something that could maybe uh, cut that uh, projected uh, budget, you know, by fifty percent or more in the next few years. Um, when when you're producing, I have I I think I think George might have mentioned he had initially approached one or two actors about the the project to see if he could get a name attached. I don't remember the name of the people. Is that something that uh, that you've been involved with too? Have you uh, have you shown it around to some actors? I know George had some actor friends. Robert Foster was one of the people that I tried contacting regarding doing an interview about George, but I haven't heard back from him. Uh, have you been in touch with any actors uh, of any note that might help? I have. I have a little, a little bit, but. Um... George was one of the famous actors. Uh -huh. And so he, as I said, uh, he ran those on his end, and they were his people. So I'm not exactly sure whom he connected with. He mentioned a few to me, but I, nothing ever came of that, um, unfortunately, at least while he was alive. So. Okay. Um, um, well, let's uh, end this segment here, and uh, we'll take a little break. And in the next segment, We'll talk a little bit more about uh, the personal side, uh, any uh, uh, incidents, any anecdotes you might have about George or uh, uh, his writing uh, uh, aside from that. And we'll do that in a moment. Uh, back with Richard Hobby, and uh, we just had a, an interesting conversation about uh, some of the pitfalls of... Uh, trying to get an independent film made. I just wanted to throw out a few things for people uh, who uh, don't know George Dickerson. And so let me just take three or four minutes just to uh, fill in the background for some people. Um, I had started my website, Cosmoetic, in 2001. And actually, two or three years before, I had uh, bought George Dickerson's book, Selected Poems, 1959 to 1999. And it, it's from Radical Press, and that's a press that he has helped co-found in the late days, and then he had a falling out apparently with one of the one of the uh, other co-founders and I've actually put up on the the YouTube uh, and also on Vimeo uh, I've made two little poem videos from some of the selected poems that he had read on some CDs that came with the book and uh, about a year or so after after uh, I had uh, started my website, Cosmoetic, I got an email from George Dickerson, and I was like, oh, I know that guy. I got his book. Uh, and so he, he had uh, emailed me back and forth. We started talking. I probably ended up talking with him an average of two to three times a year, probably for 90 minutes to two hours each time for about a dozen years. So I probably have about 50 hours worth of conversations with him uh, over the years. I never met him uh, physically. I was born in New York, but I had left New York in 91, and George lived in New York for the, the bulk of his adult life. Uh, and I did read his screenplay. Uh, I did interview him, uh, as I had mentioned at the start of this interview, both on uh, my Omniverska internet radio show back in 03. He was interviewed along with a fellow named Josh Becker, in fact, who is an independent filmmaker who did uh, some stuff with... Uh, He's usually it's sort of monster movies. He's also friends with Sam Raimi. So that's a good show for anyone. Uh, and you may show uh, on my my Cosmoetica YouTube. It's under the Omniverse. Good. 
It's George and Josh Becker for about two hours. It's a really a good show about them talking about the industry. And then George had done a written interview with me. So uh, although I never met him physically, you know, when you talk with someone for 45, 50 hours, you sort of get to, to know them. And I know George had a very... Uh, you know, strong opinions about uh, art and whatnot. And I know that in the, the last years of his life, as he became more immobile due to some problems with his legs, I think he had some arterial flow issues in his legs as he aged. And he died at 81. I think he died January 10th of this year, 2015, as we're recording. And I think he was born in 33 or 34. 33, I think it was. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think he was born in 33. Uh, and so anyone who, who Googles George, you'll find some of his writings on Cosmoetica. You'll find some information on IMDb, on a Wikipedia page. Uh, you'll, you, I think he was, as uh, Richard and I were talking in the break, he was in Death Wish 4. He was in uh, Blue Velvet by David Lynch. I think he was, as I said, I think he was in a Lynch film as well. Uh, he was in... Psycho 3 or 4, and I remember he said that was, I think, the worst experience that he had had, and I forget why. I remember he had a famous anecdote that I can't remember now. Maybe his wife will. Uh, he was hired for a television show with Lorne Green, and he he, he, he had the, he, he remember he, he was telling me the incident, and I think he, I think it's, I think he recounts it on my Omniversica show about how he was hired for a show that starred Lorne Green back in the 80s, and it was an episode where he was a guest star and it was a terribly written episode and he didn't know what to do. He, they didn't know how to act the scene and he was in the, the makeup chair and Lorn Green was next to him and Lorn Green <laughs> turned to George and said, George, how the hell are we going to do this scene? And and the two of them apparently just uh, uh, without the director's knowledge rewrote the lines. They shot it. The director didn't even notice. They told the director and the director was like, yeah, that's fine. It was great. Don't worry about it. And so <laughs> that, 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 that's... Uh, that was uh, an anecdote that I remember George had mentioned once or twice to me, and then he mentioned it also on the interview that I had done. So George was very much a raconteur. I know he had, know he had uh, been an editor at Cavalier Magazine, which was a 1950s and 60s competitor to Playboy before Penthouse. He edited that. He worked at uh, a couple of uh, major publishing houses in the 60s, uh, then he went to work as a PR man for uh, uh, a Republican congressman from, from Connecticut, which led to his getting into the diplomatic corps into, into Lebanon. And then I know he came back uh, after the war, and he had, I guess, what would now be called post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, I think George had called it shell shock originally, and that, he said, I know, led to like about a 20-year block that he couldn't write prose. He did poetry, I think. But I know he didn't do any prose until about 2000 or so. And I think that's when he first started the screenplay, if I recall. 99, 2000 is when he said. Because um, I, I think when he first contacted me, he, he said he, was, he had an idea and was working about it. And that would have been about 01, 02. Um, so anyway, that's, that's the background of George Dickerson as I knew it told to me by him. So uh, with, with that thrown out there for listeners... Um, Let's talk, Richard, about the, some of the ups and downs uh, in trying to the screenplay The Fool's Errand uh, made. Um, uh, what, you, you know, there, there had to have been some times when you were just a week away or a month away or one investor. You, you, I would think you might have had three or four people who were ready to go in, but they just wanted one other guy to jump in and then it all fell apart. So if you can, uh, for the benefit of some uh, younger filmmakers or independent filmmakers, uh, is there any like, you know, archetypal story that you can tell about uh, you were just on the verge and then it collapsed uh, or what might have happened? Sure. Well, there, there are, um, one would be um, that we had a potential investor in the Middle East and uh, he said um, uh, he was all hot to go, and he's still actually in the picture a bit, but he said, if you could get um, George Clooney, then I could raise the money. And so I reported that back to George, and he said, hey, if we had George Clooney, we could raise the money. In other words, in other words the idea was that the, 
there are people out there that love the love the idea of making the movie, um, and who genuinely believe in it. But it's a chicken and egg problem. You know, yeah. you can't raise the money until you have George Clooney, but you can't get George Clooney until you raise the money. And so George's response taught me a lesson, which was, well, yeah, if we had that big a link, then we would need to go trying to find the money from people. And so, and my idea was uh, the reverse of that from the beginning. I said, uh, you guys in New York, you've got contacts in the, in the movie industry. So you, if you could talk to famous actors and get it that way, go right ahead. But um, my idea is get the money and then go on a shopping spree and buy anything you want from equipment to, to actors from a position of strength. Well, of course, easier said than done because it's very hard to get the money without somebody famous involved. So that's one of the struggles that every, it's not, it's not that, I mean, I think every, most people know this lesson, but I, I didn't know it at the time. So I learned that lesson. Um, and we have, so when we say, when I say we came close as I look back on it, I think, well, how close was it? It sounds like more that kind of situation where they're very excited. Yeah. They definitely would put money in, but there were conditions that required us to do things, which if we did them, we wouldn't need them. Um, so there's one example. It is most, are most investors, like it sounds like, uh, is it where someone would probably put in 80% and then you'd have a bunch of 1% people, 21% investors or... Do you, do you think that, uh, ha have you encountered more situations where it's spread out, where you have maybe 10 people willing to foot 10% of the bill? Or how, how has that gone? Um, again, from, from the beginning, I was open to all possibilities. But, of course, the ideal, which is unlikely to happen, but the ideal is you get one angel or one, or maybe a tough guy investor, but one person who loves the script and sees it as viable, and then you don't have to go and try to put together five, 10, 15 different smaller investors. However, because then you then you start to get into, uh, it becomes much more, which so far hasn't been successful, but it's still my strategy is to try to limit the number of investors to one, two, or three big ones. You know, if we're looking for $20 million, try to get somebody who could put in five to 10 million over here, Another one maybe put in three or four million, and maybe another one puts in uh, another five million. And then, of course, there's always pre-sales, which you can sort of sell off, and you can get these 10, 20, 30, sometimes 40 percent um, paybacks, tax incentives by local communities or even whole countries around the world who want you to make the, the film in their country or in their community because they see it as bringing in business to them. They're willing to pay you for every dollar that you can show with the receipt that you've spent in a city or a state or a country, that entity will pay you, say, 30% back. So there's various ways you can try to put this together, but you still have to start with something. Somebody, you can't just start with that. You have to have some money. Uh, somebody's got to be willing to step up and say, I'll do it, and here's a check for $10 million. Yeah. I know, I'm, I'm trying to remember when I talked with George, uh, where was, where was, Really, if, if everything, if you'd gotten uh, everything that you needed to get going, where was the thought of uh, trying to get it filmed? Uh, you couldn't, obviously, I think Lebanon would not be a good place to shoot it. Uh, so uh, where would you, uh, where would you have shot it? In Morocco, was it? Or North, Northern Africa, I think? Well, we, we kicked around a lot of different ideas and you know, we did a continuous thought about France. We thought about Morocco. We thought about Lebanon itself. But as the thinking evolved, it narrowed down to more pro the more probable places in the last couple of years were um, on um, Cyprus, which is uh, in yeah. Lebanon, not too far away and, and has some architecture similar to what's in Lebanon, or and or in Serbia, um, or a combination of those two. Um, Serbia, because Dan Djurjevic... Um, comes from the, uh, Yugoslavia and is Serbian, and he has a lot of connections there. And the Serbians um, are offering good incentives, and he could so. And he, and he has had long discussions with people there. Cyprus, because it was a little safer probably to go there uh, than Lebanon, um, but it was very similar in the look. Yeah. We obviously, we wanted to look very very close to the original. We also did think about getting um, going in for certain scenes because there's certain kind of 
iconic places in Lebanon that, that they were hoping to get in to give it as much verisimilitude as possible. So we, we thought we might send in a, a unit into Lebanon itself, but again, the politics there would make it probably a little more difficult. It's true. But basically, Cyprus was probably our first choice in Serbia. Uh, but that isn't, obviously, we're not there yet. So those are still up in the air. If somebody came in with, with the money and said, but I, but I want you to shoot it in uh, you know, some other place, well, obviously, we would, if we could, we might do it that way. Uh, in the break, you had mentioned that uh, uh, you'd only met Georgia a couple of times uh, personally. Uh, and uh, most of your contact was was probably on the business end. Uh, do you what what was your take then? Uh, say on George uh, on a personal level, uh, if you went out, uh, were you mostly talking business? Was it mostly uh, you know getting to know you kind of stuff? Did you find him to be uh, uh, a raconteur? What what were your general impressions? And was there any anecdote or two from the couple of times you met him that stood out? Yeah, actually, it's interesting. The the even though the reason we spent a lot of time talking on the phone over these several years was because of this project. It was always from the very beginning and throughout, Dan. It was always personal. Um, he, he, in fact, uh, when this first started, I, I was going through a very difficult divorce, and uh, so it was a bit of an emotional wreck. And George. Himself having been married several times, um, and just as a friend, and being the bright fellow he was with a heart, he was actually quite helpful to me. He gave me support emotionally, and because of his brain as well as his heart, uh, was very sharp in what he said. He, had, he was really good at that. So I have very fun thoughts about him, and on the personal side, um, as being a very um, a guy that was very much there for me uh, on a personal level. Um, and uh, he also, uh, there was, I had a number of experiences which were somewhat mysterious. And he thought, that, he said, those are beautiful experiences. And he described some things that related to his life um, about when he was actually going through his own crises um, that were quite extraordinary. So it, became, it did become very personal. And we let our hair down. And so... Um, I became actually quite close to him on a personal basis. Were these, uh, when you talk about that, are these like, uh, uh, I, I last week I interviewed a, an Episcopal bishop, were these like uh, personal uh, like meetings with uh, God or, or something, or were these uh, more uh, human contacts? You know, with, Did you have like a, a born-again experience? Is that what you're implying? No, no, it wasn't like that, but um, I, uh, I saw... Uh, the a person with their face transformed and they become much younger uh, and uh, the lighting was good and it was very mysterious and very beautiful and I, I I talked to a number of people about this I said what does this mean and they said well this is not projection and this is not pathological this is a gift the person is opening up their soul and I thought well that's really it did seem beautiful and um, so I talked to George about it and he's described similar experience, or uh, he said, I understand that. He said, um, time, we carry within us at all times who we are from the moment we were born. And the, the, the outer expression of that um, is what most people see, but we carry around with us our much younger selves. And every now and then somebody lets that flood out into the open. Um, and uh, he described a, a related experience that he had uh, when he was in the military, and he was going through a real crisis, and he, he time completely slowed down. And when he got out of it, he said for several days or up to a week, everything was in slow motion. So it was very heartening to have George, but my experience was was a very positive one, and he could relate to it and explain it. He said he knew an actor who would get up on the stage, that he knew him very close, he would watch him go out on the stage, and he would drop 10 years in age, literally, not by makeup, not by some, uh, you know, because of the distance from the audience, but he would literally, his whole face would transform, uh, and he would drop 10 years in age. So um, he said, the world is a much more mysterious place, Richard, than we, you mentioned like Hamlet, 
You know, he, when he speaks to Horatio, uh, there is more on, in, in heaven and earth than are found in your philosophy, Horatio. Uh, it's a very mysterious and beautiful place. And George saw the beauty in it. And instead of seeing this as something bizarre or wrong, he saw it as part of the poetry of life and the beauty of life. And of course, he was a poet. And for him, this was normal. Um, so there's one, I, I, there's one story of yeah, now, now that you mentioned, I remember uh, early on, uh, George had sent me, uh, I, I think, some of his poems that hadn't been in his book, and I had sent him some poems of mine uh, that were not online, and when I was six years old, I had drowned in a lake in New Hampshire, and I remember being pulled from the lake, but I remember having uh, one of those kinds of experiences where I thought I saw myself uh, looking up at my body in the water towards the sun coming down into the into into the water and i remember uh having uh some odd dreams and when i was a kid i i had some experiences that people might have might call supernatural or paranormal one and i think more or less that it's it's a creative person has an ability to take what happens around them and create a narrative uh in some way and for example, like people who claim to have been abducted by UFOs, they always have the same narrative because they all have the same cultural underpinning where, you know, if they're going to see gray aliens or whatnot. Uh, there was a there was a study I would read, uh, and this is getting a little off topic, but it, I'm going to circle back to George. There was a study I'd read that in the early 60s, there was a show called The Outer Limits. And one of the episodes showed what is considered now in UFO abduction mythology, the classic gray alien with big eyes. And this this aired like less than a week before the first uh, known abduction event, Betty and Barney Hill, a, a mixed race couple that's very famous in UFO lore, seemingly abducted by aliens. And, and a lot of people who aren't creative tend to focus on those things. Back in the 80s, there was the scare of Satanists abducting children and doing all kinds of torture to them and whatnot. And so these things go in cycles, whether it's aliens or Satanists or whatnot. And I know that in, in my life, I've always thought that that was one of the things. I remember having a conversation with George too, and I, off the top of my head, maybe as I talk more with uh, his wife, Suzanne, or or Aaron, or some of the other people in his life, some of these things will come back to me. But you're mentioning that reminded me of one of the conversations I had with George. I do remember him talking about Something, I don't know if it was a, a, a near-death experience or, or something. It may have been something related to Lebanon. It may have been early. I don't recall now. It's something that it, if it comes up in conversation, I'll have to ask uh, his one of his wives uh, uh, as I talk to them. But uh, that anyway, that's one of the reasons that I'm doing uh, these, going to try to do these interviews because they bring up little aspects of the man's life that who knows? Someone uh, doing uh, this film, a director might hear one of these things and say, oh, that might be a good memory, just a little 10 second flashback to put into the George character in a film. So anyway, that's one of those those things that, that's interesting. Um, uh, but uh, uh, what when you were, when George had come and visited you in Maine, um, was it mostly talking about business then too? Because you were, if you were out with the, uh, the family or whatnot. Uh, no, oh, no, it wasn't business. That was uh, strictly, I mean, uh, we might have touched upon it, but that was uh, strictly uh, personal friendship and there were conversations about anything and everything. George uh, did talk about related matters from the screenplay, which uh, he had put in the screenplay. For example, I don't know if he, if he mentioned this to you, but when he was in Lebanon, um, he, he was stopped at a roadblock. You know, it was chaotic there at 75. And uh, one of the splinter groups put a gun to his head. He was driving a car, and uh, he was a he was a working for the United Nations. But uh, this guy was about to pull the trigger, and George just happened to know uh, because he played golf, and he got friends with the head of the caddies, I believe it was, in the Lebanon or Beirut uh, golf club. And he knew that that person was uh, the head of this particular group or, the, or, or of some group. Yeah. And George, uh, but that was a, a top secret, but George knew it. So George, as the guy puts the gun to his head, George just says the name of this man. And it, so, and it was the right, fortunately, it was the head of this guy's group. 
Yeah. So he said, okay, I won't kill you. And then he turns to the gun and shoots the guy sitting in the passenger seat in George's car that George was driving and kills him dead. Yeah. And he says, because my somebody just killed my son, I'm going to kill somebody. So, you know, I mean, <laughs> talk about quick thinking and like, you know, you could be here one moment and gone the next. But uh, that obviously did have an effect on George. I, I, I do remember that anecdote. I don't, again, this is, this is good because, I mean, like I said, I had fit. I had 50 hours of conversations. If I'd known, you know, it's one of those things uh, when when you go through life, it would be interesting if I could have had George telling that in his own story. But I, I do remember, I do remember that, uh, that uh, the golf, uh, the caddy uh, uh, thing. Um, yeah, it, 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 it's interesting, uh, those little things. Because I know I, myself, one of the things that George and I, I did on, uh, when I was in Queens on the Brooklyn Queens border, and I grew up uh, in a an area that was very similar to what you would have seen in the movie Goodfellas, I knew a lot of mobsters and whatnot, and uh, I saw a lot of violence there. Uh, and it's it's not as explicit as it is in an open wartime situation, but I saw people killed left and right all the time. In fact, one of I had done a, a, a series of poems on, on some of the murders that I had seen, and George resonated, I remember, very much with those uh, uh, poems, and he, he thought they were amongst the best uh, of my poems and the best poems he'd ever read on, on the subject of murder. And, uh, and uh, I know, uh, I'm trying to think uh, other, other things, uh, but I know that, that was one of the things, too, because George did mention... Because uh, he'd grown up in Hell's Kitchen in New York, uh, no, was he? No, he didn't. Did he grow up in New York? No, he. No, but, no, he grew, he grew up in, uh, in in the Midwest. I think right. in Indiana or somewhere out there. But by no, he Kansas, he, Kansas. Yeah, he that's right. But he lived in Hell's Kitchen. Uh, I think he uh, he might might have been only twenty or so when he moved. Maybe it was in the fifties in Hell's Kitchen. I remember he had he had mentioned uh, seeing a lot of that kind of stuff too. Uh, too. Um, I, not that he was ever involved with gangsters or anything. I know he had seen some of that thing. Uh, did you recall, did George serve in Korea? He would have probably been in Korea if he had served. Um, you know? No. I don't remember. I, I think he did serve in the military. It might have been afterwards. I know I had... Uh, military, but I can't remember where or what happened. It might have been Korea. You could yeah. be right. Yeah, that would sound that would be the right timing if it was any rap. But I don't I don't remember any stories about it, but I do I do know that he he did you know that uh, he was had a very unusual uh, cycle. He would go to bed very late at night, yeah, and get up very late. And so I he said you can call me anytime. I don't go to bed necessarily that late, but I go to bed fairly late. So I would often call him at midnight. And we would have these uh, long conversations, and they wouldn't be about the fool's errand. They would be personal conversations, yeah. and they might be about uh, the you know uh, sports, but they might be about poetry. Um, and we would just talk, and it was just really because he was so bright, and because he took an interest, and everything was personal. I uh, I, I always enjoyed talking to him uh, about anything, whether it was about <laughs> respected my opinions, and we and we often uh, saw the world similarly, but not always. And when we would get into a Discussion, it would be fruitful. So, um, but often late at night. Did George ever mention uh, some of uh, the people he knew? Because I know he he had told me that, uh, uh, and in in the written interview, he said he wished he had gotten more involved in the civil rights movement in the '60s because he had uh, a friend, Roscoe Lee Brown, who was a well-known actor uh, who died, I guess, maybe 20 years or so ago. People might people if they Google the name. He was a, a bald black fellow who had uh, uh, sideburns, and he usually played very intellectual characters uh, on television from the 60s through the 80s. And uh, I remember George was friends with him. He was friends with Leonard Cohen. Do you recall George telling you any specific anecdotes? I'm, on, on the top of my head, I remember, I remember he had mentioned something about going to a funeral or a wedding with Roscoe Lee Brown, and I think it was... I think he might have been the only white guy at the wedding, and I, for the life of me, I, I, I have maybe one of his wives will will know. But I remember there was a good anecdote. 
uh, do, do you recall him sharing any anecdotes about any of his uh, actor friends or? Uh, or I, uh, I, do, I do recall his talking not about uh, Roscoe Lee Brown, but I do recall uh, some things he said about uh, Leonard Cohen because they went to um, Columbia together back in the, in the late 50s. Yeah. And um, Leonard Cohen was, was writing poetry and he was thinking of writing a novel and I uh, was working on one. And then Leonard Cohen and his girlfriend or wound up on an island of, I forget the name of it, in, in, uh, in the Greek, uh, in the Mediterranean, in the Greek Isles. And uh, George and his then wife, I believe, I hope I've got this right, uh, visited, that, visited him. So the four of them spent quite a bit of time together in, in, in the Greek, this Greek island where, where Leonard was, was writing. And at that time, um, if I remember correctly, George told me that Leonard said, I'm thinking of becoming, because he played the guitar, I'm thinking of focusing more time on um, uh, writing uh, songs and singing them. And George said to him, don't, I wouldn't do that. You don't have the voice for it. Yeah. And, now, and George said that, of course, self-mockingly, like, what did I know? He went on to become most famous for his... His singing, and uh, so it was kind of a humorous story, uh, and uh, and they they they're still they were still in touch up to the end, um, but they um, he was really close to him back in the fifties and, and early sixties, I believe. Yeah, um, trying to remember any anything else. Um, well, let's uh, let's uh, circle back uh, and uh, sort of I guess bring this interview to a close, and if. If you find anything more uh, about George, we can always do a, a second follow-up interview. Um, so, uh, in a best-case scenario for the fool's errand, uh, what if you could sketch out the next few years? What do you think would be a best-case scenario? And then let's let's talk about what you think might be more realistic in terms of getting it to the screen. What would be the best and most realistic paths do you think over the next few years? Well, the the best case scenario would be, and the one that's actually potentially going to happen sometime later this year, is uh, my friend on the West Coast who has uh, this strong, this company that he and three other people have formed, um, would uh, take it on. And um, with, of course, obviously with the participation of Aaron and Suzanne and Dan Georgievich, and um, somehow it would be a harmonious relationship, everybody would be happy, and the movie would get made, uh, either through that or some other way. I, and that could happen. That would be the best. Now, knowing how things go in the movie industry and how difficult it is from my own experience, um, trying to get a, I mean, George has some fame, but he's not like, doesn't have the fame of a George. Um, it's it's uh, it's it's a little tricky to get it done. So maybe realistically, um, just by plugging away, Aaron and Suzanne and Dan and I and others, that we will over the next three or four years and uh, cause this to, to come forward. Uh, because I'm still working on it. Uh, it. It may not be. I may not work on it every day, but I still work on it. And I know Dan does too, and I'm sure Aaron does. So. Um, so that would be uh, that would be my both my hope, and I also, as I say, I'm cautiously optimistic. We would we would do it. What would be a it would be such a great thing to go to the theater and see this movie, The Fool's Errand, and it would say screenplay by George Dickerson. That would be uh, that would be so great because having worked with him for what five or six years on this, um, my affection for George is very strong. I he he, he was a very intense man. Um, often would, uh, you know, sometimes a little feisty, but I always trusted him, always a straight shooter, always an honest man, a true friend, and I have nothing but deep affection for him. So it would be so wonderful, and I'm still hoping that I'll be able to see his name in lights eventually, sometime in the next two to three years. Yeah. Well, I'm going to have a link to Zero Circle Films under this interview, and anyone who might watch this and wants to get in contact with you, please do so. Um, I'll also uh, hopefully have some interviews with uh, George's family, his children, his wife, his ex-wives. And uh, I'll, I'll also uh, probably ask you in, in the near future uh, to put me in touch with that Dayon Georgievich. And uh, 
hopefully I'll also try getting in touch with Leonard Cohen or if you if you think of anyone else maybe uh, uh, as well to interview and as I mentioned uh, this is sort of a, an archival project um, one of the things when I started this interview series uh, one of the the formats that I liked was the the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences I think it is they have a website where they interview a lot of stars and directors and and whatnot and uh, you know I could imagine and you know two, three hundred years, it'd be interesting to to watch, you know, some television star from the 20th century when you're, you know, floating around a satin colony or something. But, uh, uh, well, I want to thank you, Richard. And uh, like I said, we'll be in touch. And uh, if you do get any further uh, information about the film or any other, you know, memories uh, about the film, it's... Delighted to do it. And it's been a pleasure to work with talking with you.